So we're going to just continue and have kind of an open, free-ranging um, discussion about Micah's career and situation awareness. And as some of you are students who have interesting ideas for projects in the area we just heard about, um, so if you have further questions, that's great. But I just had a few that I wanted to start off with, and I think um, some of them are relevant to her talk, but some of them are a little more broad. Um, so, for instance, you you had uh, you were the chief scientist of the Air Force for a couple of years there, and um, like the defense industry has a method for acquiring and building these types of advanced technologies, and, and as you know, it takes a long, long time. And we try to push in human factors to have these kinds of research discussions and investigations up front so that you don't end up with the Tesla in mode three that's failing people, which is essentially where we're at. So in your opinion, or however else you want to put it, um, despite all this widespread recognition in our own community, why is it that these car companies uh, or whatever other industries trying to automate don't come to us and say, oh, hey, um, this year we're going to hire 50 of you and you're going to work on the Tesla and we're going we're to get through this. You're going to do the test, we're going to do the assessment. Well, they do. We yeah, have some new factors people there. And, and I don't want to be mean to the Tesla. It's actually, they did a really nice job with most of it. Um, the interface is actually really nice. I, I like a lot of what they did. It's just the automation that's not, not ready. Um, but to your broader question, you know, why, why doesn't the engineering community better recognize and understand what human factors people do? And if I step back and I'm philosophical about it, I think it's because they don't like our answer. <laughs> no, seriously, they don't like our answer. Um, they want to automate. They want to do this stuff. And we're getting in their way by saying, oh, wait, you have to look at all this human interaction stuff. And they don't want to hear it. Yeah. It's... It's not what they're trained to do. It's not what they want to do. And so the easiest way to do that is just to discount the importance of what we're doing. Absolutely. So I think that's a challenge. Um, I, my training is as a systems engineer, and people are part of that system. And if you don't include humans as part of the system, you've got failures built in, and you're going to have problems. And so I think the uh, more successful mode is, is – People have to understand you're here to make the technology successful. You're not here to throw up roadblocks. Um, you're here to work with them. And they have to understand the value of what we're providing to make a better technology and a better product. And some people get that and some people don't. Absolutely. <laughs> Do you think it's just because they're, they're just uh, listening to their own workers who are tech savvy and whatever? I mean, my husband once um, counted the number of uh, buttons on the television remote control, and I think he said it was something like 46. He yeah. said, why can't you just, you know, why can't these companies just test this on all people? Not, yeah. I mean, so, you know. <laughs> because you know, because their advantages are engineers, too, and they look at it and go, well, this is perfectly that's normal. This is perfectly fine. So they think about it the way the programmer thinks yeah. about it. They don't think about it the way the rest of us think about it. Uh, so it's been a very slow process. Now those remote controls with 4,600 uh, buttons have now been replaced by a TiVo where I can do one or two very normal acting buttons and I don't have to you know, understand exactly how every component of my system is connected anymore. The, the, the newer technologies, the technologies that are winning are actually the simpler and easier to use ones. Uh, the TiVos, the Apples, um, they've been very successful in changing the market. And I think what companies have to understand is how big of an impact that can have. I just saw a um, article that um, a company put out that does a, they did a survey of the industry, uh, Gartner, mm -hmm. the company, uh, that they, they're sort of industry analysts. But they, they found that uh, people who do user-centered design, those companies actually way outperform other companies in their fields. I think that's the kind of data we have to be able to go in and show and quantify. Hey, you know, this isn't just about it's nice. This is about adding real value to your product. You also think that um, it's kind of a role of responsibility if they can get someone to sign off on waivers saying that uh, if we crash your car, it's your fault and instead of the manufacturers. 
So it's this whole issue of liability, right? And who actually who has liability in that case? Um, right now it's you. So basically, if you think about it, you're taking li on liability for what automotive engineers in some lab did, you know, five years prior, and you have no idea how the thing even works. Are you just going to assume that liability? Um, the automotive companies don't want to take that liability on. So they're saying, well, you, you're in charge. You've got to be alert at all times. So they're doing it with warnings. Uh, in reality, um, how that's going to play out, you will get decided by the courts, I think. Um, you know, there are, uh, uh, for, a friend of mine does a lot of work in this area. She says, I'm going to put my daughter through college based on expert witnessing in court cases. She's probably right. Uh, they're, they're, uh, I think it's unsolved ground. The, the biggest problem, of course, is the automotive industry has a lot of lawyers and uh, they will stock up, but who will actually end up with that liability? I don't know. But I don't think we should take that liability personally, particularly not for automation. We don't even understand how it works. In the case of the Uber accident, though, the driver wasn't viable, was she? No, because she was a test driver for, for Uber. So Uber will probably pay off that poor woman's family. Uh, and, we, and we won't ever hear what that payoff was. But uh, I think you can do that for small numbers of accidents. But what will happen when there's much larger accidents, when they actually have more uh, hours on the road, more driving hours, if, if the accident rate is anywhere near human accident rate, that, that could be a real disincentive. This begs the question to you. You were mentioning um, uh, one of the Tesla accidents, and I think I think it must have been the one in California uh, in like March or April, where the vehicle essentially drove into a lane divider. Right. And that there was maybe an update that was released to compensate. Um, that's an argument that I hear a lot out of people who support deeply autonomous technology. They say, "Oh, well, that's fine. Like you, human drivers all have some error-prone behaviors." And I can't release a patch to fix all of them at once, but I can patch the autonomous system and instantly, supposedly, fix these kinds of errors. Um. <laughs> yeah, uh, I wish it was that simple. Um, so, for example, the Tesla accident in Florida, which was the first big one that happened, the, the guy was driving along, not paying attention as reports are, but a semi turned in front of him, right? And he went under the semi. Uh, he didn't see the semi and the, the, the uh, sensors didn't see the semi. They did modify the, the sensors after that so that it looked farther ahead, basically. Um, the problem is there are trade-offs with that. It's not a simple fix. They are making design trade-offs. So if you take the sensors and you point them further ahead instead of here, what happened after that release was suddenly my car was no longer stable on the road. It was much more swerving and wiggling. And so you, and so you, and had a tendency to even lose the edge. And so you saw trade-offs that happened when, this, when you put the sensors out. What Tesla then had to do is they said, well, we're going to double the number of sensors on the car. And I think their newer 17 models or 18 models have that. Uh, and so you're going to see that sort of learning curve, but guess what? We're all getting fixed while they're learning uh, because these are all being done on national road systems. And, and that's, that's the kind of thing you see. The, the one in California, uh, what it was was the, uh, the freeway divided, and he had to hit the barrier in between the divide. Remember how I told you that Tesla doesn't understand lane merges? It doesn't understand lane divides either. So it didn't know which way to go. And I think there were some barriers there that it didn't understand it was in that case, and so it just kept going straight. Yeah, there's been recent construction. So yeah. it's, like, it's just a little bit out of place. Yeah. yeah, so those, those are the kinds of things they're not set up to handle. And, uh, you know, the guy was probably out of the loop. It could have just been a few seconds looking away, and boom, that comes up, and, and it's, uh, it's a problem. Yeah. Let's think about some trust the tech. I mean, I've got one of the Tesla 3, mm -hmm. and I haven't been brave enough to allow it to do its automated stop at a traffic lights. I know it doesn't, I just think it doesn't, doesn't even stop at a traffic lights, I don't know. But if a car stopped in front, it's supposed to stop before it hits it. However, it's going really, really, really fast, and I haven't been brave enough to allow it to do that 
because I don't know how it's going to respond. It won't. Stop on the brakes. So here's, here's another one of those unexpected mode interactions. If, if you're going along at 60 miles an hour and the car in front of you is going, you know, 40 or 50 or 60 or whatever, it stops, it will stop too because you're both kind of going at the same speed and, you, and, and it, it can stop too. If it stops dead still and you come up to it at 60 miles an hour, it won't see the car react in time to stop before it hits that car. It will not. It doesn't see that far ahead. And it's because of the speed differential. Right. Well, you're right, but no one tells you that. No one tells you that. That's so I, I have this issue on the, the highway when I get, I get on Highway 60 over here and there's a stoplight. And if there are no cars there, it'll blow right through the stoplight. If there are cars there, it will come up and actually hit that vehicle if I don't stop. If there's traffic with me and that traffic light turns red, then we'll all stop together and I won't have to intervene. So from the experience of the driver, this has now become a complex situation. It's not just green, go, red, stop. It's a very complex set of do I step on the brakes or don't I step on the brakes, depending on what's going on. But do not trust it to stop with, with the stopped vehicle. You, it, it will hit it. It does not have enough time. At least that's my experience. Yeah. So I was under the impression that the, the sensors were like on par with human sight, but like what's the equivalent or not? So what's what's the differential and why why aren't they on par with, with human sight? I mean, I wouldn't think that would be that difficult. Um, there's different technology out there, and uh, there's LiDAR is what some companies are using, which I think is more capable, but it's also a lot more expensive. And so Tesla has used radar, which you could get much more inexpensively, and they just put a lot in, and uh, so they can get it to market faster. Uh, but a lot of the technology is not just the sensor, it's being able to check and understand what it's looking at. And even small changes can completely confuse uh, these sensors into what they're actually seeing. There's, there's a lot of interesting stuff on, on online about that if you want to look at, at uh, sensor perception. Well, I, I don't know how anyone could get in one of those cars. I, <laughs> you just don't put it in autonomous mode. You just have to put it in autonomous mode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 electric, the electric driving capability is actually really good. Wow. I, I love that. I never have to go to gas stations. So I have another question that's not related to automobiles, but to situation awareness. And I think you mentioned in your, your talk that typically it's left up to training to make up the, the differences. The displays aren't you know, transparent and predictable enough. Um, but I recently had an experience. I had to accompany somebody to LabCorp. LabCorp, I don't know. It's a place where you get blood stuff done. So they've taken the, uh, the checkout counter, they have big signs, there's the people sitting there. Don't check in here, check in at automatic kiosk at the back of the rooms. And they have these three, they look, look like ATM teller machines and like a gas station, little freestanding things. So go up and use it, and it has a video. It shows you exactly what to do, like place your driver's license in the tray below, and it has a video doing this. Then. When the green light goes, flip it over, it'll automatically scan your information, and then you go through a few little things. It's supposed to take like 15 seconds. So my experience with it was very simple. I'm like, ah, oh, this is awesome. I'm like, whoa, this is so great. They're so smart. Da, da, da. But then I sat down and was waiting and watched probably 20 people come through and of varying ages, but a lot of them were probably like in the 65 plus and they walked in looked at the sign looked at the kiosk and was like nope I'm not going to use it I don't know how so then they walked to the front and the the gals that were sitting there were you know quite annoyed nope sorry we can't help you go to the back check in so they'd be grudging to go back and I mean some of them it would take them like 15 minutes and finally they'd just go up to the front and say I can't do this so they eventually would have to come out teach them how to do it and say you know, this is how you do it. And a lot of complaints were, oh, I didn't know which way to flip my driver's license. It didn't tell me, but I'm like, there's a video, it's right there. But still, so it's just, like I think, like in my mind, I like the, well, well, if we just offer more training, we'll teach you how to do it, we'll teach you, we'll teach you. But 
then it gets into the thing, well, let's automate the training because then we can train way more people. With, so I don't know even what my question is, but. So, well, <laughs> no, there's what there's do we do? Question. So there's a relevant question there. Yeah. So most of the research we have in automation, you have to realize, has been conducted on people like pilots, who are a highly selected population, highly trained. Um, they're, they're people who you know run power plants and stuff. They, it, we're seeing a lot of training. They're, they're pretty educated people. The test profile for people who bought automated vehicles, quite frankly, is not your average person. They're early adopters, so they're technologically savvy. They're people who've had enough money to buy very expensive vehicles. Um, they're mostly male, by the way, not, not as many women. But it, it's a very selected subgroup of society. <laughs> When you start expanding that to everybody, there's a lot of people who aren't that tech savvy, who aren't comfortable with technology, um, and there's there's as many people who, quite frankly, are under a 100 IQ as are above 100 IQ. So you've got people who maybe aren't that bright, who are drivers today. Are they going to be doing this? And then you get elderly who aren't that comfortable with technology. I mean, my mother's a bright person. I ended up as her tech support for trying to explain how her computer works over the phone. Oh, heaven forbid, <laughs> you know, she would try to try to use one of these things. And I don't think she would, by the way. But, but even what you and I might consider simple to do is not necessarily what every driver would be simple, would yeah. consider easy to do. Right. I guess. So it's a challenge. The auto automobile industry has not really dealt with, I think, that problem set yet. What, what they're shooting for, and I think what or what they believe will happen is we're going to make it so easy that it's just like getting in a taxi cab and it'll take you where you want to go. I don't think we're quite there even. And, and even be able to enter, you know, here's the address I want you to take me to. And by the way, I want to stop here or there. It, it won't necessarily get. So there's going to be a, just, just basic training, I think, to interact with your average eight-year-old driver who gets in and gives a whole rambling discussion of where they want to go. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, following the earlier question, if you are able to tell autonomous cars from manually controlled cars on the road, would that uh, uh, affect your emotions or driving behaviors if you know this autonomous car driving routine? I think autonomous vehicles should have a sign on them the way that um, <laughs> student drivers do. You know, if this is a student driver, I know to just kind of stay back. <laughs> if I knew that was an automated mode, I would know to just kind of stay back, get a little bit of birth here, you know. Uh, so, but they don't have that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the challenges right now that there, a lot of people are researching, which is kind of interesting, is how do these vehicles deal with pedestrians and bicyclists? So, my, all of my experience is actually on the highway. The Tesla doesn't work with the darn on certain streets because it doesn't understand intersections. So, so there's no point in turning it on in between, you know, one block at a time. It doesn't work. Uh, but, but a lot of these do, and that's, that's kind of where they're doing research. Well, right now, if I'm driving around campus here and uh, there's pedestrians who want to cross the road, they look, they look and they look at my eyes to see, do I see them? Am I going to stop for them? And they're, they're judging that based on behaviors of my vehicle and based on eye contact and things like that. So there's people looking at well, what happens with an automated vehicle. There's nobody sitting in the seat. How does it know what's going to happen? How do we communicate intent, intent of vehicles to pedestrians and drivers and uh, uh, bicyclists and things like that? So that's actually kind of interesting. Uh, and how, how do they interact with them? Uh, one really interesting story I heard, um, this was when they were test driving the, the Waymo car. And the, you know, they test drove it with, with uh, test drivers. And it got to a stop sign. And the car kept going like this, kept going back and forth. And the guys were going, what's going on? And they look in the, the four-way intersection, there's a bicyclist. And he's kind of going back and forth on his bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the car was just like, go, not go, go, not go. Because he couldn't decide what the driver was doing. So, you know, they, they laughed and, you know, typed away to say, what, you know, here was a problem, a new problem they had to figure out how to solve. But, but those are just the sort of things that you and I would solve, like, sort of, you know, I bow the guy and say, go ahead, you know, we wave at him, go ahead, you know, we, we have ways of communicating. How is the car going to say, go ahead, you know, or figure out who's going or not going? And, and will people just do things like that to screw with it? You know, <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> so we haven't talked about connectivity. 
So yeah. the idea is that we'll have smart highways and that every car will be connected to every other car and to the pedestrians. And, to, and so it'll just automatically know where you are at any time and not hit you or hit other cars. So I don't know if that's going to save the day or not. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there, there are automation concepts which instead of having individual vehicles, they're like all connected by uh, you know, electronically. Uh, so you can do things like um, moving as a fleet down the highway and being more efficient and things like that. But a lot of those require a lot more infrastructure than we have. And I think the challenge is who's going to pay for the infrastructure? You know, the highway system is already laid in. It's already been paid for. Are they really going to pay to lay in a lot more infrastructure for automated vehicles? And I don't. So far, that hasn't happened. But at some point, government still wants to pay the train. Yeah, still, exactly. Because the train, yeah. But yeah. the governments have to pay a lot of money for that, and yeah. they don't. They don't have an incentive to do it. No, 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 no. Isn't there like infrastructure in the airways, the like pass and all that stuff? Isn't that like kind of like similar? And like using how flights and like certain paths that go to planes and certain routes. So wouldn't that be kind of similar talking about that building that into the infrastructure as far as transferring well, to the road? Yeah, I mean the paths are independent of highway systems though. So you, the path that like there's a, a path that goes from East Phoenix straight to the to the airport mm -hmm. and it goes across lots of different kinds of streets. So there those are imaginary paths. The infrastructure that these systems need are things like uh, they have special lanes that have uh, particular kinds of uh, capabilities built into the road system, or they have internet capability that all co provides connectivity for the vehicles. Uh, and we have very spotty internet connectivity in this country still. So it's a different it's a different kind of infrastructure, I guess, is what I want to say. Speaking along that, um, my husband works in construction management. He does a lot with the city of Phoenix and surrounding areas, and they have had in their recent discussions about, okay, so when do we need to start getting ready for this changed infrastructure on automated vehicles? And it'll just be, you know, there are ideas that kicked around, or it'll just be this certain section of Phoenix or this certain road or at this certain time that, vehicles will have to either switch on to automated mode or not, like, you know, in the future. And their ideas about um, who will pay for it will be dependent on, you know, the business that's building whatever as a normal course of action. I'm building a new hotel. I need to pay for all of the surrounding street structure. That's typically how it is now. So they're kind of trying to theorize about what to do about it. I mean, yeah. at least they're talking about it, but they don't, they don't know what they're doing yeah, I mean, I, I, it's nice they're thinking about it. I, I would, I, I, the crystal ball is pretty fuzzy, I think, for <laughs> their ability to predict that. Uh, I, again, I think there's just a huge amount of hype. Uh, going back to Gartner, which does these industry analysis, right now they've got it on the hype bubble. And it hasn't peaked yet, but I, I think it will peak uh, because reality is going to set in, and, and so a lot of this will disappear in a few years as they realize, oh, this was a lot harder than we thought it was. I would say it's going to go away. I think it's still going to be in development by a lot of companies, but I hopefully they'll stop overhyping it. Yeah, I, I would I would know how to answer this question. They put it this way: I would not know. Yeah, given, it's, given what we know today. Yeah, it's just it, it, it seems like it is more of that hype, like oh, what are we going to do when? Or maybe we could do this, but it's nothing. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, they have no idea. You know. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that I can't remember if it was Toyota or Honda. Um, essentially lobbied the, the Senate, the Congress in California or Nevada or someplace like that to redo their entire road surface. Like, you need to place these indicators. We have these little indicators you can put in the lanes, you need to put them in every lane everywhere. And I mean, that was like a lobbyist kind of motion. So I mean, the companies, I think, will be the ones maybe that really push to have it done so that their particular brand of autonomous system will function appropriately. Um, and certainly that, I mean, I would think that would help safety. But the problem is that there are lots of these cognitive things like uh, Mike had mentioned about communications between drivers. You put all the sensors on the road that you want, that doesn't solve the pedestrian problem. Um, although I did see a cool thing that Jaguar is doing with 
showing big googly eyes on the front of the car and having them look at them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe there are various solutions out there. My guess is that that was a human factors driven project. Like, there's no way that an engineer thought, oh, I need to look at people with my eyes and, and I think I'd want to rock my bike back and forth just to see the human factors. Yeah, people see it in an unintended consequence, right? Yeah. Like, but as soon as you get caught up in the interactive vehicle instead of just walking across the path. Um, so certainly something. So uh, I wanted to touch on something that's kind of bothered me about the rise of autonomous vehicles. That's that we've gone from, you know, the fits list, MAVA, MAVA, men are better at kind of thing, and we moved on to levels of automation, which had their own kinds of problems, and then sort of the meta levels where we talked about degrees, right? Where not not just the amount of automation, but also the the point in the decision making that you're ramping this up. How are we? How are we still telling industry? How are they still centered on this levels of automation approach? Well, Did, was that yeah. our fault? <laughs> no, no. I mean, I think I think our industry spent a lot of time working out how how is automation different? How does it affect people? And what are these really getting very specific about what these different levels are? And uh, you know, a lot of my work was looking at well, if we can do it this way, this way, different kinds of levels. Uh, a lot of other people, uh, the, the Par Sherman scale, you know, I, I sort of merged those because they were they're really very similar um, in terms of their findings and, and what we would come out of it. I think it's made us, I think it gave us a structure for really understanding what was happening with automation. So I, I think it was very fundamental. But if you look at what industry is doing with levels of automation, like the ones I was presenting, they have absolutely nothing to do with any of that. They sort of just created their own, mm -hmm. which have to do with what they care about, which is how much you're automating, you know, what they consider levels of automation, which is completely supervisory control oriented, completely different forms. I think they've just gone in their own realm. Uh, and then there's other industries which have different ones, by the way. So oh, yeah. there's, there's, because everybody just reinvents the wheel and that's the problem. It seems like you'd be very, you'd be very hard for us to test um, those levels of autonomy. They're very ill-defined. As a matter of fact, they keep morphing because they figure out that whatever somebody came up with off the top of their head really wasn't very sufficient. So, uh, yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. And that leads to my next question is, uh, how do you really see the future of essay measurement going? Um, driving presents itself as a really nice domain for it because yeah. unlike the people who sort of don't like the SIGOT method, like you could put people in a simulator and actually stop the simulation, interrupt them, ask questions, do the kind of standard essay techniques that you developed. Um, so yeah, is that the future? Is it more SIGOT style stuff? Or? So I'm actually in the middle of doing a review. And um, so, so are you familiar with SAGIT? Okay, so you, it's a freeze <laughs> technique where you're, you're driving, a, you, in the simulation, you freeze length of screens and ask them what they think is happening and then start it back up and you can compare what the answer is to reality because you run the simulator. So it, it gives you a nice objective measure. Um, that, that measure's been used, I think, in hundreds of papers now. Um, and actually, the, reliable, the, the sensitivity rate's very good. Um, you get good diagnostic information from it. Um, it has been used in driving simulators quite successfully in a number of cases, so I think it's good for that. I do not recommend using it in real life cars. <laughs> I actually tried doing that in my Tesla. Uh, not being able to freeze it, of course, but, but um, I would had a timer go off, and I had to like think of the answers, and I had to, uh, audio recorded them, and it, it's very it interferes a lot if you're trying to drive at the same time. Yeah. Uh, I don't recommend doing second. I don't remember doing span probes while you're driving either, because it yeah. is very interfering. Yeah. Um, but it's great in a simulator. Uh, the thing that I find is interesting is all this is all this discussion about can you use it in real life or just in simulators or whatever, and all the studies I found, both for second and for span. All seem to be in simulators. Right. So um, it, it's, it's a very good tool for this in, in simulation devices. Okay. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Um, do you, like, are you aware of any real time measures, not um, in sim simulations, but like in real life? Um, so, to think how to answer that question. Um, there's direct measures, which are things like the probes or subjective measures. The subjective measures don't correlate well with the objective measures, so that's that's one thing. Then there are process measures, 
uh, like I think Nancy does a lot with communications, and that works well in certain kinds of team tasks, for example, where you have natural uh, communications going on. Um, so there's those kinds of process measures or eye tracking measures where you're trying to look at where they're, go where they're, where they're looking at. Um, eye tracking measures are, are good for looking at gaze, you know, so you can say, were they looking out the window, were they looking down at their, their you know, phone, whatever. You, you can get some of that kind of information. What you don't get is the, uh, the phenomenon of, of look but don't see. So, you know, I can be looking at something and thinking of something completely else, and I just don't even notice it. I don't register it. Uh, it doesn't give you any information about understanding or projection either. So those are fairly limited. Um, the work there hasn't been much, there has the other direction there hasn't been much work in yet is in the uh, physiological measures. Yeah. So can we come up with uh, things like P300 or other physiological measures which might give us some indication? And um, there's been a little bit of work there, but not a lot. So I think I think that could be more well developed to see if there's something there. Um, but it's it's challenging. I mean, I, I wish there was something simple and easy that we could say, oh yeah, we can do this, but uh, if, if there was, I'd have done it a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, the eye tracking thing is very um, seductive. I think a lot of engineers, especially people who are like engineering minded, human focused people, look at eye tracking and think it's a solution. It's like, well, if I can just see where everyone's looking, then we're done here. That's not the case at all. And is a solution for the quantitative science the usual saying that get as much as measures like either surrogates, process, and all of them, then after that you can compare? I think I think you're tapping into very different things. And I think there is a benefit to looking at um, what those different measures are telling you. So for instance, we've done look work looking at objective and subjective measures. Well the subjective measures don't correlate well with objective measures, uh, but they do correlate well with confidence level. And actually that's useful in decision, understanding decision making is how much confidence people have actually has an impact as well as how accurate their essay is. When we've looked at process measures, like the kinds of behaviors they're doing, the kinds of communications they're doing, then you can compare that to your, your second measure and say, well, which one of these processes was more effective? What processes do experts do that are different than novices? And what kind of different outcomes do they get? So I think it gives you different orthogonal perspectives that help build a broader picture, depending on what questions you're asking and what you want to look at. I also want to take a moment and give you a platform to what I expect will be a little, at least a little bit of a rant on um, the use of Sagat appropriately, because I feel like I read an awful <laughs> lot of papers where people claim to be using the Sagat method and then don't do like the first four steps in how to create the right questions and actually make them um, apply and more reliable than yeah. in the case. Of I can tell you where people screw it up. <laughs> okay, that's good. One, they don't do the, they don't come up with, with good questions. And so the, the problems I will see is the like, yes, completely vague questions. So I read, I read one paper where they, they showed their questions to three different experts and the experts couldn't come up with the same answer. And so therefore, they said it was a problem with the method. I'm like, no, it's bad problem. You have bad questions. You don't have good questions. You're not going to get good answers, right? So experts can't. If, it, if the questions are so ambiguous, experts can't come up with the right answer. Looking at the looking at the data, then you got a problem with your questions. So that that's one issue. Um, you have to do a, a cognitive task analysis to actually understand what are essay requirements for your domain. And so I'll see people skip that, and they sort of ask questions about the situation, but they're not necessarily things you need to know to have situation awareness. So I'll, I'll give an example. Go back to driving. One person was asking me, well, I'm going to ask them how many pedestrians are on the road and which way the pedestrians are facing. And I'm going, well, those aren't questions about the situation, but I don't think they're questions that I as a driver would ever remotely care about, right? Um, your questions actually need to relate to what are your situation or requirements, and those are a function of what your decisions are. So you have to really do, we do a, a goal-directed task analysis to say what are your goals, what are your decisions, and your, what are your essay requirements, and those essay requirements are at the, you know, perception, comprehension, and projection level. Um, so they may want to know whether or not there's a pedestrian that's going to cross the street if you're in a, in a, uh, you know, near a crosswalk or in a, in a city street, but 
otherwise you probably don't care about how many pedestrians are by the side of the road. So those, those are just examples of, of what I see happen. Um, a lot of the spam questions, I think, unfortunately, fall prey to that. They'll ask a lot of things like how many airplanes without that necessarily being the kind of thing that the controllers want to know about. Right. Um, so that's, that's one big issue is questions. Uh, the second big problem I see is uh, the diversity and how people analyze them. So when I've scored the data, I typically look at drill world. So you say X, you know, you say you're going 60 miles an hour, you're really going 63 miles an hour, that's within, you know, plus or minus five, so we'll call that a correct answer. And we're just looking at percent correct. Um, some people have said we want to use D prime. And so they want to penalize for, it's a sensitivity measure because they want to penalize for false alarms and correct hits and things like that. I did not do that intentionally because I developed it looking at fire pilots and I wanted them to get the benefit of the doubt. So I wanted them to have, you know, whatever their best guess was, their best knowledge was, they may not be sure. That's what they would have been making a decision on. I wanted to get, get benefit of that, and if they thought there were, you know, seven bad guys and there were six bad guys, that really wasn't a bad thing in that world. Uh, some other people have said, no, we really we want to analyze it differently and do a deep prime measure. I don't really have a problem with that. Um, I, I've seen people do that in some industries and think that's okay. Um, the thing I see that, that I think gets people astray is they want to combine measures. So a SAG guy might ask you 10 different questions. They want to add them all up and say, that's your essay score. And, I, and that, that ends up being very uh, unsensitive. Or, or it's, it's not sensitive at least half the time for the studies I've looked at. Uh, because it wipes out differences. And so, for example, if I'm, uh, you know, I did a study looking at 3D displays. And what I found was you were, you're, with a 3D display, your knowledge of altitude of the aircraft went up, but your knowledge of range and bearing went down. If I just added those all together, it would seem like there was no difference. But really, there was, there was shifts in the impact of information you were tending to and what you knew about and didn't know about. And that's what happens with a lot of our manipulations, whether the training manipulations or design manipulations or automation manipulations. And so you wipe out your differences when you just add them together. Uh, if you go through and you do a... Um, Analysis where you, you calculate Cronbach alpha. Um, you look at whether or not the things are correlated, which is what you have to do whether you, when you add individual measures together. They don't tend to hang together well. There, there's really no good statistical basis for combining the, uh, the individual measures. So I don't recommend it. Uh, and that's, that's another thing that I see people do uh, poorly when they, when they do it. Um, the other thing I will say when I've I've looked at the data. Sagitt does really well with experts in simulation environments. It does not do as well in micro worlds with students. There's a lot of research gets done with, you know, college sophomores in micro worlds because they have no situational awareness. They have no clue. <laughs> and, and the data shows. And, and we've seen lots of differences even in, in you know, novices to experts in a lot of different domains of just how clueless novices are, even when they've got 60, 70 hours of experience, say, in, in being general aviation pilots, or uh, we've looked at military uh, infantrymen who've had, like, a year of training versus three years of training, and the essay differences are staggering. So I think what happens in a lot of these studies is they have college sophomores doing some made-up task and they say it doesn't work because their essay is so low. Well, guess what? Their essay is low because they don't, they don't have any mental models for absorbing and understanding the data. So that's the other area where I see it not do as well. What do you think about, um, I think it seems, it seems to me at least to be a field-wide issue with the uh, assessment of understanding. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, and I, I've done some of this work, so I, I have good measures for level one because it's pretty easy. Those are the ones everyone does. If you ever read a paper and they measure essay, you can almost guarantee that they pass or looked at level one essay. Um, or maybe they've gotten the three and I did that too because projecting the future is something you can ask somebody about or at least look at their behavior. If someone anticipated something, then you know, 
that you want in the first place. Totally. Yeah. It's the understanding and that comprehension part that really seems to elude, um, let's say, the common man's measurement. Yeah. But yet, it seems like that for autonomous vehicles may actually be, along with projection, one of the, one of the most important things. So how are we going to get that to the, to the level of granularity we can actually work with? Yeah, usually it's um, the way we score that is subject matter expert assessments. So you, you have people with perfect knowledge who can make assessments of, of that. And so in trying to think what, my, what, what, what your level two questions are in driving, um, uh, like things like is weather, you know, is weather an impact on vehicle safety? Okay, you should be able to test and see whether or not it actually is reducing skid traction or something like that or visibility. For example, um, you know, an expert should be able to assess that. Or, um, um, what is the, um, you know, is is that is a vehicle um, a, uh, a a collision threat? For example, although that's probably some level three. See, that's the problem. Yeah. And by the way, I have to I have to say up front, these levels are conceptual levels. It can also, there's more of a continuum, and it can sometimes be very hard to decide, oh, this is level one, and this is level two, and this is level three. I don't think there's very clear dividing lines sometimes between them. So I, I shouldn't really tell you that. Levels of what? So levels of situation. Well, like, yeah. So typically we call level one, based, do you, are you aware of basic data? Level two is do you understand the significance of that information for your decisions? And level three is uh, can you project what's going to happen in the near future? So it's like levels of wasps. It, it's, it's levels of understanding, as, it's levels of situational awareness, but it's, it's how, how deep you understand what's going on with the situation. Uh, what we find is that experts are really good at projecting what's going to happen, for example, at least in the near future. Um, and that allows you to be proactive. So a uh, level three essay is sort of a hallmark of expertise. Um, level, you know, level one, you know, I can get in a cockpit and I can read every gauge there, but I couldn't tell you what it meant, mm -hmm. right? I would think that experts would have perhaps like lower level one. I um, already know like the basic yeah. functions and everything, and they don't really have to look at everything unless something's really off. Yeah. Know? So. I, I actually looked at that question early on. I wondered, do, you know, do you retain level one if you've got level two and level three? And at least in the pilot community, I was finding good retention uh, and knowledge of that situation representation. They actually cared about the level one data uh, as much as the level two and level three. Now, that, I don't know if that's true in every domain, but, but it was certainly true in, in that domain. Like the primary displays or... Uh, yeah, basic flight status. So they certainly needed to know, you know, what their flaps were at and their altitude and their heading and things like that they, they cared about. Um, so they, they retained that knowledge. In, in driving, you know, a lot of level one you may not think you really care about, um, but you, want, you need to know things like, you know, other vehicles, you know, is there somebody in your blind spot? Is there, you know, somebody ahead of you? Uh, the big one for level two is, you know, am I am I under the speed limit or not? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So uh, there there are some that are out there, and I just actually I've got a book chapter coming out where I went through with a uh, analysis of different essay levels for driving. Oh, perfect. so that might be useful. Yeah. And uh, I think we're I think we're closing in on time. I just wanted to say that uh, do you think that there would be any value in more academics try to build task analysis or try to do like some really deep goal-directed task analysis in driving since it seems like unlike if I do if I do this for a, uh, a mission controller on a carrier somewhere that's going to be good for him and then yeah. and or her and then like nobody else if I do this for a driver potentially that's useful for everybody who drives yeah at least in the US maybe or at least yeah. in California maybe. yeah yeah I think I think we do need one uh, we have done some um, most of these things are too big and hairy to get published. Um, I, I, I'll send you the book chapter where I pull out the essay requirements we did out of that one. That's great. Um, but but it, is, it is useful. <laughs> and there are people who've done you know, good SAGIT 
studies uh, in driving simulators. Uh, Haber and Ma did some, sure. some nice work with automation, so they, they usually come up with pretty good questions. Although they, they tend to add their, their questions together, which, I, which always bothers me, but anyway. <laughs> I always like Leo Bugardin's perspective on hazard avoidance because I thought that was a very prescient like task that you're doing in driving. Yeah. And half the time you really are just trying not to hit anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, because so much of it becomes again out of the time. I think the whole projection thing with um, AI is kind of interesting that AI and these autonomous vehicles don't do projection. And so I think it suggests a good way to team up humans with the AI, like they did in that chess. Um, mm -hmm. Tournament where the did you know about this? Where the uh, all AI uh, chess game uh, did not win. The uh, all human chess master did not win. Some very good humans teamed with the AI did win. And so I think it's it's that very projection that the humans are able to help the AI with. Yeah. So it's like they know um, they call them broken leg cues. These are cues, uh, so if you ask somebody, AI or humans, to predict whether a particular judge will be on the bench one day, the AI can accumulate all of the information uh, about past judges and who was where, when, and can make a prediction. But the human may be better because they know that the judge just broke his or her leg and therefore will be out of commission for a while. So there are certain things that humans are pretty good at that take AI is a long way away. People are much better at novel. Mm -hmm. The AI systems just learn what they've been trained to learn, and they're not good at novel. And that's that's the ch that's the challenge. And so, I think our 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 real challenge as human factors people is how do we keep the human in the loop and understanding in order to contribute that expert knowledge, uh, and not have them completely zone out and and lose awareness. Uh, that that's going to be an issue. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks again. Uh, looks like we've got, got you up just in time. Okay.